This is the New Jersey Resilient Communities Program instructional webinar. This webinar will provide information about a new infrastructure grant program and how communities impacted by Hurricane Ida can apply for funding to construct infrastructure to make their communities more resistant to future disasters. This instructional webinar is for leadership of eligible communities who want to learn more about the program and are interested in completing the application. This presentation will include the following topics, program overview, eligible applicants and eligible activities, program structure, application process, application requirements, application review and selection, and grant award. It will not address activities following the grant award in great detail. Communities awarded funds will receive additional training and guidance following grant execution. Program Overview The Resilient Communities Program was designed with four objectives in mind. Reduce or eliminate the long-term risk of loss of life, injury, damage to and loss of property and suffering and hardship by lessening the impact of future disasters. Also, to recover from the disaster impacts of Hurricane Ida. To protect publicly funded recovery investments in impacted communities. And finally, to expand awareness of federal infrastructure programs, especially FEMA's National Building Resilient Infrastructure in Communities Program, or BRIC, within the state and help build the capacity of local governments to apply for funding through federal programs. Detailed policy guidelines can be found on the Resilient Communities webpage with other information and resources on the program. This document can be used as a reference for all program applicants and those who subsequently receive awards under the program. The policy guidelines provide detailed description of the program, including program overview, application and priorities, review and selection process, grant agreement, federal and state requirements, performance reporting, compliance and monitoring, and grant closeout. New Jersey is launching the Resilient Communities Program to support development of resilient infrastructure designed to fortify communities against future natural hazards that have been determined to be threats to the state. These include coastal erosion or sea level rise, dam or levee failure, earthquakes, floods, landslides, hurricanes, nor'easters, severe storms, severe temperature events, severe winter weather, and wildfire. The program will award competitive grants up to $5 million to eligible jurisdictions throughout the most impacted and distressed counties from Hurricane Ida. Eligible applicants will be responsible for the implementation, operation, and maintenance of awarded projects and subject to state and federal rules guiding use of funds for this purpose. The state of New Jersey was awarded $377,575,000 in Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Funds, or CDBG-DR, appropriated by Congress for recovery from Hurricane Ida. New Jersey is using the grant to fund a range of programs, including housing, infrastructure, planning, and related services. More information about how the funding is being used can be found on the website and the state's CDBG-DR Action Plan. Currently, the state is allocating $54 million from the Hurricane Ida CDBG-DR grant and an additional $2,940,000 from the Hurricane Sandy CDBG-DR grant to the Resilient Communities Program. This is subject to change if the state receives additional funding or if it decides to reallocate funds across programs. Eligible Applicants and Eligible Activities Eligible applicants must be located within the Ida Most Impacted and Distressed Communities, or MID. These include Bergen, Essex, Gloucester, Hudson, Hunterdon, Mercer, Middlesex, Morris, Passaic, Somerset, Union, and Warren. Eligible entities that can apply are cities, townships, counties, special districts, and federally recognized tribal governments. Entities are eligible to apply for no more than one distinct project, though exceptions can be made for multi-jurisdiction projects. Homeowners, businesses, and nonprofits, community organizations, and other types of entities not mentioned above cannot apply directly to RCP. They may partner with an eligible entity in their area to assist in developing an application that reflects their priorities for mitigation. RCP projects must address hazard mitigation needs in the mid-counties to anticipated hazards identified earlier in this presentation and within the mitigation needs assessment within the CDBG DR action plan. Activities must meet HUD's definition of mitigation, that is, activities that increase resilience to disasters 
and reduce or eliminate the long-term risk of loss of life, injury, damage to, and loss of property, and suffering and hardship by lessening the impact of future disasters. Activities must also meet one of HUD's national objectives by benefiting a minimum threshold of low or moderate income people or households or addressing an urgent need. Detailed criteria for meeting a national objective is described in the application materials and will be considered as part of the application review process. At a minimum, projects proposed under RCP must be technically feasible and effective at reducing hazard risks. They must be designed to increase resilience and reduce risk to humans and property, especially critical services and facilities. They must solve a problem independently or constitute a functional portion of a larger infrastructure solution for which there is assurance that the project will be completed and there is a reasonable plan and available funding for completion. They must conform with all applicable environmental planning and historic preservation laws and regulations. They must conform with all applicable state, federal, tribal, and local floodplain and land use laws and regulations. They must also conform with the latest published editions of relevant codes, comply with the federal flood risk management standard. They must not have started construction work and they must be CDBG eligible activities under Title I of the Housing and Community Development Act. Examples of eligible activities may include, but are not limited to, property acquisition and demolition, structural elevation, construction or reconstruction of infrastructure, installation of public works or facilities, structural retrofitting, infrastructure retrofits, site or other improvements, or dry flood proofing. The following activities are generally ineligible unless authorized specifically under special HUD provisions. The purchase of equipment, operating and maintenance expenses. Specific to this program, the following activities are ineligible. Costs associated with any pre-award activities and pre-award project planning, including project design, project scoping, site plans, or environmental review undertaken prior to grant execution. Land use or comprehensive planning that does not explicitly contribute to the completion of the project. Upgrades beyond those determined necessary. Costs not directly attributable to the project's construction. Costs of supplies, equipment, or labor beyond market rate or rates otherwise required by law. And change in scope beyond the funding availability. A fully detailed list of ineligible activities and their descriptions can be found in 24 CFR 570.207, unless waived by HUD and is applicable to this funding. Program structure. CDBG DR funds are appropriated by Congress and administered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. HUD allocated this grant to the state of New Jersey for recovery from Hurricane Ida. The grant is being administered by New Jersey's Department of Community Affairs. Funding will be awarded competitively through an application and scoring process to jurisdictions within the mid area. Jurisdictions awarded funds will enter a subrecipient agreement with the state and will be subject to all applicable federal, state, and local rules and requirements. Subrecipients receive funding on a cost reimbursement basis upon the terms identified in the grant agreement. This means that subrecipients must verify all costs before submitting invoices to DCA for reimbursement and provide all required reporting and supporting documentation. This includes grant agreements, contracts, procurement files, and program files as requested by DCA. All activities reflected in the application budget and subsequently funded must be necessary and reasonable as assessed by DCA and HUD. RCP awards up to $5 million per project, but project budgets can and should leverage funds from other sources. The subrecipient's budget must provide a comprehensive picture of RCP funds, local funds, and any other committed sources outside of RCP for the project. Prior to executing a grant agreement to fund a project, DCEA maintains the right to adjust award amounts independent of the proposed budget submitted by applicants during the competition. DCA and the awardee will agree upon the grant terms, including scope and budget, prior to signing the grant agreement. Federal law prohibits any entity from receiving duplicative financial assistance for the same disaster recovery purpose from multiple sources. Subrecipients of this program must ensure that RCP grant funds do not duplicate support from other federal, state, and local resources. RCP funds, therefore, can supplement other sources of funding for a project, but cannot replace other sources. RCP funds that are found to duplicate other sources will be recaptured by DCA. To ensure there is no duplication of benefits, 
DCA requires applicants to disclose all other benefits received or which will be received for the proposed project. Subrecipients will provide timely and ongoing updates to DCA about additional funds received for the same purpose as the funded project. Duplication of benefits will be monitored regularly. Subrecipients of RCP must agree to comply with all applicable federal, state, and municipal laws, rules, and regulations as applicable to the activities of their grant under the CDBG-DR grant program. Applicants must register with Federal System of Award Management and NJ Start to apply for the program. Subrecipients that expend $750,000 or more in federal awards during their fiscal year must have a single or program-specific audit conducted for that year. Federal conflict of interest law prohibits people involved in administering or decision-making from obtaining financial benefit from the CDBG DR funded activity or have financial interest in any contract or agreement resulting from the CDBG DR activity. Federal Civil Rights Act and Fair Housing Act requirements prohibit discrimination against protected classes and ensure equal access and non-discrimination related to housing. All projects will be monitored to ensure systems, protocols, and ongoing efforts to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse of funding. Subrecipients are also held to various reporting requirements with regard to the project, including but not limited to project performance, resilience performance metrics, financial progress, Section 3, which provides requirements for hiring low and very low income workers, and Davis-Bacon, which provides for specified labor standards. These are just a few of the requirements that each subrecipient will be held to. Recipients of RCP must comply with all applicable environmental rules. Each RCP recipient must complete an environmental review that is approved by DCA before construction can begin. Applicants need not start the environmental review process until after they are awarded funds and a grant agreement is signed. DCA encourages communities committed to their project to begin planning and to begin an environmental review if local resources permit. Please note, pre-award activities are not eligible for reimbursement of RCP funding. After applying for the program and prior to receiving approval of the ER, RCP recipients may engage in preliminary planning and environmental review processes, but they are prohibited from engaging in choice limiting actions. These include acquisition, demolition, bidding and construction activities that may commit the applicant to a project design that is not ultimately fundable. Otherwise, applicants risk beginning a project that will be difficult or impossible to fully fund with most sources of funding. Typically, an ER can be initiated once a plan reaches 30% design. Once an ER is approved after grant execution, DCA will issue a notice to proceed permitting activities to continue. Application process. The application period began June 28, 2023. Applications will be due December 15, 2023, with anticipated awards announced April 15, 2024. Contracts will be executed beginning July 26, 2024. Interested communities that are eligible to apply must first register on the program website. The registration page provides access to a notice of funding availability, the application form, and supplemental application materials. Registration also enters you into an applicant listserv for regular updates and communications. All applications must be submitted to resilient communities at dca.nj.gov by 11.59 p.m. on December 15, 2023. The Notice of Funding Availability, or NOFA, is available at the registration page and provides detailed information about the following. Program Overview, Eligibility, Schedule, project requirements, application instructions and guidance, and information about scoring and award selection. The state has established program priorities to steer communities towards outcomes that align with program objectives. Projects will be evaluated based on the degree to which the application meets these priorities. The project must mitigate the risk to public infrastructure, people, and property, protect and benefit disadvantaged communities, it should be a cost-effective solution to natural hazard risks. It should promote resiliency as well as social, environmental, and economic outcomes.
The design should consider climate change in future conditions. The budget should leverage federal, state, and local partnerships. The project should be designed with public input and meaningful stakeholder engagement. It should be based on a feasible budget and timeframe, and it should incorporate nature-based solutions if applicable. Additional consideration will be made for projects that are generated from previous resilience planning awards. Also, projects that are ready for construction will be offered additional points. Each priority is captured within the technical scoring criteria that will be used to assess applications. Each criterion is assigned points, all of which add up to a total possible amount of 190. The application is organized according to the score criteria and cover all the topics related to design, approach, applicant capacity, and cost. Next, we will cover the specific details about each of these criteria. Score criteria are listed with points available and application components used to assess that criterion. Cost effectiveness is worth up to 35 points. This is an assessment of the effectiveness of the project at protecting community and critical infrastructure relative to its cost. The analysis is based on other established federal benefit cost analysis methods. Applicants will complete a cost effectiveness worksheet. Implementation measures or implementation capacity is worth up to 30 points. This is an assessment of capacity to manage project costs and schedule, the capacity of technical and managerial staff and quality control and compliance processes. Applicants will complete an implementation plan worksheet. Nature-based solutions is worth up to 20 points. This is an assessment of whether a project incorporates one or more nature-based solutions, which are sustainable environmental management practices that restore, mimic, or enhance natural and natural systems or processes and support natural hazard risk mitigation. Examples might include restoration of rivers, floodplains, wetlands and reefs, living shorelines, and bioretention systems. This is assessed through a written response within the application. Risk reduction is worth up to 20 points. This is an assessment of how and to what extent the project will reduce hazard risk to the community, including both quantitative and qualitative outcomes. This is assessed through a written response in the application form. Climate change in future conditions is worth up to 20 points. This is an assessment of how the project will enhance climate adaptation and response to the effects of climate change and other future conditions. This is also assessed through a written response in the application form. Community engagement and outreach is worth up to 15 points. This is the assessment of the outreach strategy used to garner feedback from the whole community, especially disadvantaged communities, on the project to advance hazard mitigation and how stakeholder input will continue to be used to help direct project execution. This is assessed through a written response in the application form. Mitigation of risk to critical infrastructure is worth up to 10 points. This is an assessment of how the project mitigates natural hazard risk to critical physical facilities, uh, structures, and systems that provide support to a community, its population, and its economy. This is assessed through a written response in the application form. Partnerships is worth up to five points. This is an assessment of how well the applicant incorporates partnerships with other entities, such as neighboring communities, government, private and nonprofit partners into the project. This includes describing anticipated outcomes of partnerships to the community, especially disadvantaged communities. This is assessed through a written response in the application form and portions of the implementation plan and the budget. Previous planning award receives up to five points. This is demonstration that the project was generated from an eligible planning program funded through the state or federal government. This is assessed through written response in the application form and supporting documentation that must be submitted with the application. Project status is awarded up to five points. This is demonstration that the project is shovel ready or when planning and engineering is advanced enough that with sufficient funding construction can begin soon. This is assessed through written response in the application form, as well as supporting documentation.
Application Requirements In order to be considered for funding, the following documents are required. The application must be submitted by December 15, 2023. Scores are determined through review of application packets, which include prompts for written narrative and completed worksheets that capture information to support the scores. This includes the application form, cost-effectiveness worksheet, budget worksheet, implementation plan, low moderate income area worksheet, social vulnerability index worksheet, supporting documentation including project site maps, public notice documents, planning award documents, and project status documents. Some of these may not be applicable to each application. The application form is divided up into sections and can be typed into and saved to your computer. Section A captures information about the applicant entity, contact information, basic project information, and local hazard mitigation plans. Notably, applicants must be a party to a current FEMA-approved local, tribal, county, or multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan. Please list any current hazard mitigation plan the applicant jurisdiction is part of that covers the area benefiting from this project. This section also provides space to input other relevant information about the applicant entity. Section B of the application form collects information about threshold criteria that each application is required to meet in order to be reviewed. As mentioned, projects must benefit a community within one or more counties designated as impacted by Hurricane Ida. These include Bergen, Essex, Hudson, Middlesex, Passaic, Somerset, Union, Gloucester, Hunterdon, Mercer, Morris, and Warren. Section B of the application form also collects information about the national objective each project meets. As noted before, projects must meet one of three HUD national objectives. The first is low mod area benefit. This is when the project service area contains over 51% low or moderate income persons. Applicants who can meet this requirement should complete the supplemental LMA worksheet which is described later in this webinar. Another national objective that a project can meet is low mod limited clientele. This is when activities provide benefits to a specific group of vulnerable persons rather than everyone in an area generally. To meet this requirement, applicants will complete a written response describing, describing the target population. Lastly, another national objective that a project can meet is urgent need. This is when activities respond to a serious need resulting from the recent disaster and alleviate conditions that pose a serious immediate threat to the health and welfare of the community. To meet this requirement, applicants can complete the written response in the application form describing the activity. Notably, due to requirements HUD has placed on New Jersey CDBG DR grant, uh, LMA, LMC projects will receive priority over others that meet the urgent need national objective. Another threshold requirement is to demonstrate that the applicant sought feedback on the project plan from the public by holding a public hearing in compliance with New Jersey Citizen Participation Plan. Applicants can meet this requirement by hosting a virtual or in-person public meeting and allowing for a 14-day public comment period. Notification of the hearing must be posted on the community website at least five days prior to the event. The hearing must cover community development and housing needs, including for low-income populations, and how the potential activity will address that need. They must also describe the proposed project, including the type of project proposed, the sources of funds and amounts, the date by which comments must be made, and a contact person for the project. The application must include documentation of the public hearing advertisement, meeting sign-in sheets and meeting minutes, and comments received during the 14-day comment period. In addition to the requirement to solicit feedback from the public through a hearing and comment period, applicants will also be scored on their overall strategy to engage with the public, especially vulnerable populations directly impacted by the project, and incorporating feedback into the design process and project implementation. Applicants are given an opportunity to describe public engagement activities within the application form. Section C of the application form, Project Summary, provides applicants an opportunity to write a narrative response describing a high-level overview of the project, including description of project activities, 
the necessary acquisitions or easements tie back to either disaster related risks and impacts or projected hazard risks, project goals and anticipated outcomes, and ancillary benefits such as social, economic, and environmental outcomes. Section D of the application form is simply a reference to an external worksheet called the cost effectiveness worksheet. Applicants are required to complete this worksheet to demonstrate the cost effectiveness of their project. The worksheet establishes a standard method for all applicants to document costs and benefits and ensure that RCP projects will reduce risk to people and communities in ways that are cost effective. To complete a successful project application, a minimum amount of technical information is required for reviewers to evaluate high level project cost effectiveness, which requires input from the applicants, project engineers, designers, or planners. Guidance on completing the cost effectiveness worksheet will be covered later in this webinar and in a separate instructional video. Section E of the application form refers to the implementation plan worksheet. Proper implementation requires that applicants ensure the human capital and financial resources needed to complete the project are in place and develop a realistic timetable. The implementation plan captures information about management of costs and schedule, project implementation capacity and planning, technical and managerial staff and resources, and procedures to ensure quality control and compliance with all requirements. Guidance on completing the implementation plan worksheet will be covered later in this webinar and in a separate instructional video. Section F of the application form refers to population impacted. This provides an opportunity for applicants to describe community-wide benefits and impacts to disadvantaged communities and specifically how the project was designed with disadvantaged or vulnerable populations in mind. This also refers to a separate application worksheet, the Social Vulnerability Index Worksheet. Applicants are required to complete the SVI worksheet in order to receive additional points for serving an area with 0.6 Social Vulnerability Index or higher. The Social Vulnerability Index uses US Census data to determine the relative social vulnerability of every census tract in the United States. The SVI ranks each tract on 14 social factors and groups them into four related themes. Each tract receives an overall ranking of vulnerability based on the census data, which can be found on the CDC website. Guidance on completing the SVI worksheet will be covered later in this webinar and in a separate instructional video. This program prioritizes projects that seek to incorporate nature-based solutions into design. These are sustainable environmental management practices that restore, mimic, and or enhance nature and natural systems or processes and support natural hazard risk mitigation. In section G of the application form, applicants are provided an opportunity to describe how the project includes any nature-based solutions or design elements, if applicable. The response should describe the strategy, how the project relies on the nature-based approach, and how the nature-based approach contributes to the anticipated outcomes of the project on hazard mitigation, economic, social, and environmental efforts. Section H of the application form is on risk reduction, resilience, and effectiveness. It's an opportunity for applicants to describe how and to what extent the project will reduce hazard risk to the community, including both quantitative and qualitative outcomes. Applicants should describe the value to the community that the proposed activity adds in the short term during normal circumstances, as well as how the project will enhance resilience in the long term and during natural disasters. Section I is on climate change and other future conditions. Applicants will describe how the project enhances climate adaptation and responds to the effects of climate change, as well as how it responds to the effects of other future conditions, such as population and demographic changes and land use changes. Responses must include documentation of sources of information and data used to inform design of the project. Some of those sources may be found in New Jersey's CDBG DR action plan, which includes a mitigation needs assessment. Section J focuses on community engagement and outreach. Applicants must implement an outreach strategy and supporting activities that help bring legitimacy to the project and gain feedback from the community. In addition to the public hearing required as part of the application, applicants will describe the community planning processes leveraged, the stakeholders involved, including partners and those from disadvantaged communities, and how this input is being used in design and execution of the project. Section K of the application form focuses on how the project mitigates risk to critical infrastructure. 
Applicants will describe how the project mitigates natural hazard risk to critical physical structures, facilities, and systems that provide support to the community, the population, and its economy. Responses should clearly describe the link between the specific outputs of the project scope and the anticipated risk reduction to critical infrastructure. Section L of the application form focuses on partnerships. Leveraging partnerships provides applicants the complementary strength and flexibility in project execution from neighboring communities, states, federal government, and nonprofit or private partners. Applicants will describe the partners that the applicant plans to work with and their roles in the project. They will explain how the partners will contribute to project implementation and the anticipated benefits of these partnerships. This can include funding commitments as well. Information on partners is also captured through the budget worksheet and the implementation plan. The Resilient Communities Program is recognizing project concepts developed through formal planning programs. Communities applying for funding for project plans developed through such programs must demonstrate that the application was generated from a planning award. These include FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Assistance Project Scoping Award, the BRIC Non-Financial Direct Technical Assistance Program, Resilient New Jersey, or another state or federal planning award. The applicant should indicate the anticipated or actual date of plan completion for this prior award and describe the deliverables for the previous award and explain the link between that prior award and the proposed project. To receive points, the application must include documentation of this planning award. Section N of the application form collects information about project status. Projects that are shovel ready will receive additional points. A project is considered shovel ready when planning and engineering is advanced enough that with sufficient funding, construction can begin within a short amount of time. Applicants can demonstrate that a project is shovel ready by providing a detailed description on the status of the project in the application form and by attaching supporting documentation. It's important to note that all projects awarded funding, regardless of their status, must still undergo an environmental review that is compliant with HUD and New Jersey law and receives a notice to proceed from DCA prior to initiating choice limiting actions. Applications must be signed and dated to be considered complete. Section O includes the opportunity to sign and acknowledge various certifications relevant to this program. First, Resilient Communities Program is voluntary in nature. Also, applicants may withdraw at any point up to and including executing the grant agreement. The certification also testifies that information provided in the application is accurate. Also, that environmental review must be completed before a notice to proceed on choice limiting actions can be issued or construction can begin. Please note that once an application is submitted to the program, choice limiting actions, as defined in 24 CFR 58.22, are prohibited until the environmental review is approved by New Jersey's Department of Community Affairs. This also certifies that the budget includes all financial assistance received or expected to date. This is to ensure there are no du duplicative benefits. Application packets are not complete without including supporting documents as attachments. Applications must include one or more maps of the project site and area of benefit. Maps should clearly show boundaries of project work area and construction, as well as common geographic markers, such as roads, jurisdiction boundaries, nearby landmarks, etc. Maps can be converted to PDF and submitted as part of the application package. As mentioned, projects are evaluated based on how cost-effective they are at reducing hazard risk. Applicants can demonstrate the cost-effectiveness of their project by completing a cost-effectiveness worksheet and including that within their application. The details provided within this worksheet should reflect the best available information and may require consultation with project engineers or specialists. Applicants must provide the sources of information, including title and contact person, used to complete the worksheet. The actual source documentation should be maintained and provided upon request. Structures that should be identified in this worksheet include critical community infrastructure or facilities, such as hospitals, fire or police stations, critical utility facilities and or infrastructure, such as water, electricity and communications facilities, roads and bridges, housing unit estimates, and other critical facilities. A separate instructional video on how to complete the cost-effectiveness worksheet is posted on the registration page. All applicants must describe the budget for their proposed project, which includes the sources of funding. 
the budget demonstrates that the project is cost reasonable and can be feasibly completed at cost. It also demonstrates that CDBG DR funds are not being duplicated with other funding for the same purpose. The budget includes all anticipated costs by category. Each activity subtask includes space to describe funding sources, purpose, and justification. All sources of funding, including RCP, local funds, and any other committed sources should be documented. The budget must include funding for ongoing operation and maintenance after a project completion, which grantees must certify they can fund and which is not an eligible expense of CDBG DR RCP funds. The total assistance received expected table provides a space to identify all sources of funding and its purpose to determine if there is a duplication of benefits. A separate instructional video on how to complete the budget worksheet is posted on the registration page. Applicants must provide clear evidence of their ability to implement the project on time and within budget. Applicants must complete each section of this implementation plan worksheet broken out into the following sections. Project overview, milestones and tasks, current and anticipated staffing, partners, and monitoring quality control mechanisms. Applicants whose projects can meet the low mod area national objective must demonstrate this using the LMA worksheet and submit it with your application. The worksheet provides guidance on selecting the project service area and using HUD's LMI summary mapping tool to document the data and determine whether the percent of population of low or moderate income persons exceeds the required threshold to meet the LMA national objective. Please note that many communities in New Jersey's mid counties have an exception waiver from HUD, allowing them to meet the LMI criteria with an LMI population percent that is lower than 51%. The worksheet includes the exception criteria for New Jersey communities for the fiscal year 2022. Also note that New Jersey DCA may consider survey data if available to determine an area benefit. Applicants interested in submitting survey data instead of census data should contact DCA to discuss requirements for gathering and submitting data that meets HUD requirement. Projects benefiting an area with a social vulnerability index score of 0.6 or higher will receive five additional points in the scoring process for the Resilient Communities Program. Applicants whose projects meet this criteria must complete the worksheet to document the SVI score of the project service area in order to receive points. First, determine the service area of the project, then document the SVI score for each census tract associated wholly or partially with the service area using the Centers for Disease Control SVI mapping application. The average of the SVI scores across all census tracts is calculated to, to determine the overall SVI score for the project. A separate instructional video on how to complete the SVI worksheet is posted on the registration page. We've now reviewed all of the documents required as part of an application packet for the Resilient Communities Program. Application form must be signed and dated. Maps of the area benefiting from the project, the cost effectiveness worksheet, the budget worksheet, the implementation plan, the public notice compliance documentation, the social vulnerability index worksheet, if it applies, the LMA worksheet, if using LMA as the national objective, supporting documentation from prior planning awards, if applicable, and supporting documentation demonstrating shovel-ready project, if applicable. Next, we will go through the application submission process. Complete and save each application document, including the application form, to your computer. Review the document checklist within your application form and check all completed documents to make sure your application packet is complete. Save each document as applicant name underscore form title. For example, the town of Smallville would save their application form as Smallville underscore application form dot PDF. Zip all application documents using a zip file program and name the zip file applicant name RCP. For example, Smallville RCP dot zip. Attach the zip file to an email addressed to resilientcommunities at dca.nj.gov. The subject line should be RCP application for applicant name. For example, R RCP application for Smallville. Applicants will receive confirmation of receipt of the application packet from DCA via email within seven days of submission. 
If you have not received confirmation within seven days, please reach out to Resilient Communities at dca.nj.gov. If you have any questions about submission or any issues, again, please reach out to the Resilient Communities email address. All completed applications must be submitted by December 15th, 2023 to be considered. DCA will offer technical assistance on the application process and requirements through this webinar and additional instructional videos posted on the registration page. We will respond to questions through the email address resilientcommunities.dca.nj.gov. All questions and responses will be updated and published as an FAQ document on the Resilient Communities Program website. Following selection and grant execution, DCA will offer training and ongoing guidance to RCP subrecipients on grant administration, state and federal requirements, and project implementation. Application Review and Selection Receipt of applications will be followed by an application threshold review, which will determine whether the application is complete and the applicant and project are eligible for funding. This phase is unscored. DCA will further review only the applications that meet the following threshold criteria. The application is submitted on time. The application is signed and complete. The applicant entity is an eligible type of jurisdiction. The applicant's project benefits HUD or the state identified mid area. The applicant meets either the LMI or urgent need national objective requirement and the applicant submitted evidence of compliance with the public notice requirement. Responses that meet the minimum threshold criteria will then be evaluated according to the technical scoring criteria. Projects awarded funding through RCP will be reviewed and selected through a multi-phase process to comply with all applicable regulations and requirements and to ensure that funding goes to projects that respond to the stated goals and objectives of the Resilient Communities Program. Applications will be reviewed by a panel as part of a technical scoring process. The review panel will generate individual scores using the established score criteria and resolve any score discrepancies. Review panels will then generate composite scores of applications and deliver application summaries and recommendations to DCA leadership for approval. The pool of applications that meet an LMI national objective will be prioritized to help New Jersey meet its HUD overall benefit requirement of 70% of the grant program. Projects selected for funding by DCA will be offered all or a portion of the total requested funding amount. DCA reserves the right to fund individual components of a proposed project depending on available funding and program priorities, including the need to meet the LMI overall benefit. During the review, the review panel may need clarification from applicants on the application details. Applicants are required to respond in a timely manner to any DCA requests for information materials to complete the evaluation process. Any request for additional information will include a definitive due date for return of the requested information. If the applicant needs an extension, clarification, or assistance, the applicant may make its request within the allotted response timeframe. If an applicant fails to provide the requested information or materials or fails to ask for an extension or assistance, the applicant's response will be closed and disqualified. Grant execution. DCA leadership will select and allocate funds to projects based on technical evaluation of scores and program priorities. Once award amounts are determined, DCA will send a notification of award to successful applicants, which is a preliminary offer to enter into a grant agreement. Applicants not immediately selected for award will be notified of their status as well. Awards are not final until both parties execute the grant agreement. This workflow summarizes the key steps in the application process, review and selection process, and grant agreement execution through construction start. Actual project schedules may vary depending on when applicants begin planning and conducting an environmental review. Please review the workflow carefully to understand the steps that are required during the application and review period up through construction start. Any appeals to the program are reviewed against program policies and requirements. Appeals will be reviewed by a three-person panel made up of independent legal and regulatory affairs staff who will make a recommendation to the Deputy Commissioner of Disaster Recovery and Mitigation and who will make a final appeal determination. Appeals must be submitted in writing and include all required information. 
contact information, project explanation, and documentation. Execution of a grant agreement is contingent upon both parties' agreement on terms and conditions of funding. Awards will be considered final only upon receipt of a signed grant agreement between DCA and the awardee. The terms and conditions include project details such as project scope, project timeline, budget, state and federal rules and regulations, financial administration, environmental review, HUD, CDBG, DR requirements, labor and civil rights standards, and monitoring and compliance plans, among others. Of note, RCP projects must be completed within three years of grant execution in order to meet HUD timeliness requirements. Thank you for your interest in the Resilient Communities Program. Additional resources and information can be found on the Resilient Communities webpage. Also, in the Resilient Communities Policy Guidelines that are posted on the webpage, and within the Resilient Communities NOFA found on the registration page. Any questions can be emailed to resilientcommunities at dca.nj.gov. In the future, we will be posting instructional videos and a frequently asked questions document that is regularly updated.